Hello! Welcome to The Voracious Reader. Today I'm excited to share with you a book called The Twelve Secrets of Highly Creative Women by Gail McKean, M Mick Meekin. Sorry, Gail. Gail McMeekin. Gail was a, um, a therapist and after years and years of helping people with therapy, she herself became so fascinated with the concept of creativity, uh, how it works, what encourages creativity, what kills it, and um, studied so many successful women. Um, she interviewed way more than 40 women and then um, narrowed it down to a pool of a little less than 40 very successful authors, teachers, artists who shared what they believed to be their secrets of creativity. And her goal was to create this portable mentor, the 12 secrets of highly creative women, um, so that any of us out there aspiring to navigate the creative realms um, have this portable mentor that we can look at and, and, and learn from. And so I want to share with you today what I learned from the 12 secrets. What are the 12 secrets? Well, secret number one is acknowledge your creative self. And to display that, I'll use the author herself as the example. She talks in the first chapter about how she... Um, had this creative yearning and urge to create this book. She feels like it's the book she was meant to write. And so the process of coming to terms with um, that, it's not therapy to do interviews and write a book. That's interviewing and being an author. So to follow those creative urges was a way that she acknowledged her creative self. So think about you in your own life and where does your creativity come? It might not be in your job. I have known folks who are um, professional say accountants maybe, but then turns out in their private lives they're the most amazing cake decorators, right? So I mean, where is your creative inspiration? It doesn't have to have anything to do with how you make money in this world. What makes your heart sing? Um, what does your soul want to do in your free time? And so what, um, what are your creative inspirations? Honor that creative part of yourself and that's secret number one. Secret number two is to then honor those inspirations and um, some ideas about how to do that. One is creating a sanctuary in your home, whether that's a corner of your bedroom or a specific room that is your place to be with yourself and your creative inspirations. Maybe it's a place where you'd have a spinning wheel or an easel with your paint or a journal and a pen or just a quiet meditation room. It depends on what your art is. and. Art can be anything. We limit ourselves so much into thinking what is art and what is not. Um, go beyond. Go beyond the initial thought of what art is and ask yourself, um, what is your art? What, do you, what, are you, what can you share with the world that is a little bit different, a little bit more unique than the way anybody else does it? That's your art. Follow your fascinations. So what fascinates you? Do you find yourself drawn to a particular time in history or a certain kind of decoration? When you go to people's homes, you like a, a modern contemporary versus Victorian styles. Um, are you fascinated with biographies or mysteries or romance novels? Um, travel, what fascinates you? Where would you want to go? Those are all clues and places to look for where you might be hiding your creative self. Um, so surrender to creative cycles is secret number four. We all know that everything in life is temporary. It goes through cycles of birth and death and rebirth. Um, creativity is no different. In fact, in many ways, it's more volatilely going through those processes. Just when you think you're in a big birth moment, it turns out to be the death of something else. And um, learning to navigate the realms of change through art and creativity is why I am so fascinated by um, how creativity, psychology, and quantum physics and all that work together because I think it's all part of that creation process. We ourselves are a creation. The universe created itself. You know, whatever belief system you have behind, be, behind how that came to be, it's still an act of creation. And um, creativity and creation fascinates me. Uh, number five, commit to self-focus. And for a society of folks who have been trained to put others first, um, and often, you know, women um, 
are asked to be more submissive, put the needs of their family first, that sort of thing. Um, committing to self-focus might be a real challenge. So I learned a lot in this chapter. I'm going to share some of the key things were um, confronting fears of selfishness. I don't want to be perceived as selfish. I bet you don't either. It's no fun. And so to actually say to my significant other, no, I'm not going to do this thing that you want to do because I need to take care of myself. And that requires that I have this time in my sanctuary alone. Um, more often than not, my husband's thrilled and happy to support me in doing that. I just have to voice my need. But for me to get to a place where I could be really confident, comfortable, and not feel guilty about voicing my own need, it took a little work. Um, putting yourself on top of the priority list. Okay, well, that just, self that just sounds selfish. Now we're right back to confronting fears of selfishness. So there's a cycle right there. Just when I think I'm at the big birth moment of putting myself first, instead of a big birth moment, it's a death of selfishness guilt. So you see how that works? Hmm. This is why I'm so fascinated by mapping out that inner territory. Honor your holistic style, whatever your holistic style is. Setting boundaries. That's tough. I had to create a little stop sign that I hold up. If I'm in the middle of something and somebody comes in because my um, sanctuary doesn't have a door, I can hold up the stop sign. And then everybody in my family knows to respect that. Or I can have the stop sign sitting out so I don't actually have to have the interruption. Creating solitude. This was a huge learning for me. It was tough for me to realize that while I appear as an extrovert, when I take the Myers-Briggs type indicator, which measures extroversion and introversion, I'm really, I'm in the middle. I have just as much introvert as I do extrovert. And the times in my life when I get snarky, it's because I have not had enough solitude. I absolutely require a certain amount of solitude in order to function in the world, even though I appear to be an extrovert. Big learning, big learning there. Um, and then last, supporting the self-focus in other women. When I can encourage other women to take care of themselves, I'm like paying it forward in a way. I'm passing it on. We have to be role models for each other. I thought that was a key learning in this book. All right, so I spent enough time on secret number five. Secret number six is conquering saboteurs, which could be um, you. You're not valuing your own natural abilities, not seeing that they are of value. Um, maybe you're dealing with some old wounds you need to work through. Um, maybe they are other people who are, are sabotaging your efforts. Um, but you need to learn to recognize them, and there are lots of resources available to help combat them once you recognize them. Secret number seven is consult with guides. Um, whatever you feel that to be, that could be a mentor, uh, an inspirational work, someone who does an art similar to what you have to offer. Um, could be your spiritual center, meditation, or God, or... Um, your church or affiliation, whatever, wherever you go for guidance, consult your guides regularly. Uh, select empowering partnerships and groups. Um, we get easily, um, um, what's the word, uh, m m uh, distracted by our desire to belong. And then we allow ourselves to fit into a group that isn't really meeting our expectations or supporting or nurturing our creative selves because we'd rather stick around in that group than be alone because we perceive we'll be alone if we don't fit in with the group. Um, more often than not, the more you step into your own creativity and who you truly are, you actually attract more interesting people in your life because now you're, because you're fascinated with, um, Victorian art, say, then you find out some exhibit is coming into town. And so instead of going to hang out with this group that you always hang out with, that they're good friends and you love them and they'll be a part of your life, they don't feed this part of your soul, you're not going to go spend Saturday with them. You're going to go to this art show instead. And when you go there, you meet new people who have this same fascination. So you, you have to feed that and um, select empowering partnerships and alignments. Number nine, transcend uh, roadblocks. Um, and some suggestions she has on that are one developing rejection resilience. It can be done. It does. It, it doesn't feel good to be rejected. It's so painful. 
Oh my gosh, they didn't like what I did. Ouch, that hurts my ego bone so badly. But over time, you do get a thicker skin, you do develop a resilience, and somehow there's like a magical thing that happens when you develop that resilience. You begin to value your own opinion. What a cool concept. You realize that you happen to know more about this particular subject, idea, passion than maybe the whoever's rejecting you does. And therefore, you start to think, they might not be the most credible source. And you start to evaluate criticism instead of just taking it on as a personal affront. You say, oh, well, they might have had a point about this part of it, but really I know more about this part. And even if this is this, then I feel okay with that. But anyway, you start to really assess that for yourself instead of just being reactionary to what other people think. Um, dedicate yourself to excellence. And then you know you really are doing what you believe to be best. You're not taking shortcuts. And so um, criticism doesn't have to hurt as much when you know for sure you didn't take any shortcuts. You did this the way you intended to do it. Um, even if it's something that somebody else perceives as a shortcut according to their value system, for you it's not a shortcut. Maybe it was more efficient to do it that way and you made that as a conscious choice. Value that. Convey strength instead of desperation. We all know how unattractive desperation is. It's okay to feel desperation, but you don't necessarily have to convey it. Desperation maybe is a sign or a trigger for you to know you need to go spend some time in your sanctuary and enjoy yourself. So pick yourself up again and then move on to secret number 10, which is living in abundance with positive priorities. First off, you have to define abundance. Most folks think of that as money. I realize I'm rushing. And that's because there is so much to say. And the objective of these is so that you can walk away feeling as though you've learned something and read the book. This is kind of a thick book. So I'm sorry I'm rushing. Um, tap into the power of gratitude. Gratitude fills us up with a sense of abundance. So it doesn't have to just be money. Um, go for a walk and pick out a pretty stone. And uh, know that that was free. It was available to you. And it presented itself in your path. That's a sense of abundance. Do what you love. Care for your body and mind. Know what supports and detracts from your creativity. You want to feed your creativity and give your creativity a sense of abundance. So if um, daily walks um, or bike rides or something, time in nature feeds your creativity, that will help you feel more abundant. Um, if your daily commute depletes your creativity that's something that takes away your abundance try to find a way to make that commute more abundant filling it with music or um i'm not sure what you have to be creative to come up with that but think about the ways that you can feed your creativity so that your creativity feels abundant regardless of finances um and then identify your personal positive priorities that's secret number 10. Secret number 11 is um, subtract serenity stealers. So anybody in your life that is um, taking away your serenity, it's easy to say get them out of your life, but that's not necessarily what you need to do. What you need to do is figure out a way for them to not steal your serenity anymore. Why are you giving it to them? And why would you give, just give that away? Your serenity is yours, and you're in charge of it, and you're in control of it. So subtract serenity stealers. If you need to do a little work to find out what those are, there are lots of modalities available to help you with that. And last but not least, secret number 12 is so almost mundane. <laughs> Plan. <laughs> Plan and set goals and work towards your goals. Um, smart goals, you know, measurable, specific, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to give you a big speech on goal setting because there's so many resources out there on that topic. Um, but you know what? I really like that it's secret number 12, um, not because it's um, like the last and most important secret. No, it's the opposite. It's sort of like it's the least, it's not the least important, but it's the least creative. It's, it's, uh, it's at the end so you don't get distracted by the planning. That's what I'm trying to say. Because if we jump into planning, it's like brainstorming. Nothing kills brainstorming faster than the logic of will that work. When, once you're in planning mode and setting goals and being smart and measurable and specific, you can kill your creativity. So the trick of secret number 12 is learning how to do that planning after you've worked through some of the other secrets 
and you have a good creative project that's got legs and enough meat that some planning isn't going to kill it, if that makes sense. So hopefully you feel like you've read the book now and so you don't have to read it. But if you do, it's called The Twelve um, Secrets of Highly Creative Women by Gail McMeekin. Thank you for joining me. Create a great day.